Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Random Redshirt Podcast. I am one of the hosts, Zach, and with me, as always, is the other host, Chris. What's up, Chris? Hello, everyone. Hello, Zach. Everyone around the interwebs in the world, great to be here again. Awesome to see you, my friend. Awesome to see you as well. And uh, we are back uh, just a few hours from the last <laughs> time we recorded for episode five of Star Trek Strange New World season two. And uh, we're, we're knocking these out as we're catching yeah. up after after being away for a couple of weeks for some scheduling and work mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, and so we're looking forward to continuing to catch up here on our recaps and, and reviews and deep dives of season two of Strange New World episode by episode. Um, we talked last night about, uh, having kind of a fun, whimsical episode, and now we're gonna, we're gonna get back into a little bit of a, of a, of a deeper episode, a heavier episode this, this, uh, on this one. A little more six. serious. Yes. yes. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. So if this is your first time joining us, welcome to the podcast. Uh, we are just two nerdy guys who love all things nerdy and sci-fi. We talk about Star Trek, Star Wars, and everything in between. Um, be sure to hit us up on Facebook and Instagram. You can follow us there. Uh, if you are listening to us on our pot, the, whatever your favorite podcast platform is, you can check us out on YouTube and see the video version of this episode. Uh, and if you are watching us on YouTube, just note that not all of our episodes are on here. Um, only the ones we've recorded with video. We have a ton that we only recorded in audio when we first got going for the first couple seasons of the podcast, actually. Um, but uh, this one is... A great episode. As we look at episode number six, we are passing the halfway point of season two of Strange New World, which is crazy because I feel like Strange New World season two just started. Yeah, I do too. And and I like these last few episodes that, or all the episodes in season two have been unique in a way that they're focusing on specific characters really nice. Yeah. It's, take, it's taking time to kind of, you know, enjoy those characters get a little bit more on their backstory, get a little bit more on their personalities and what they like and who they are. And I thought, you know, that's that's a great, since it's such a great ensemble cast, this is a great way to get to know them more and have each character have its own um, highlight and focus and special time. Yeah, I've really enjoyed, <clears throat> if you look back at season one and now season two, I've really enjoyed um, the characters that they've created in this show, right, both old and new, right? You have characters that are being a little bit reimagined from from where we know them in Toss and so forth. And then we're also getting a great mix of new characters. And mm -hmm. it's it's a balancing act, right? Because when you, when you make a show like Star Trek and you go back to a time period that has been done before, right? I mean, the, the original series era, obviously, has been done before. Maybe not, you know, a deep look into Pike and his time as captain of the Enterprise, but... Because obviously we only had that one episode of him with the well, you had the cage and then you had the menagerie part one and two, which looks back to it. But you know what I mean? Like yeah. that really just that one that one specific episode centered around him. Um, it's you can mess things up if you don't do it right. Oh, and yeah. I think that the 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 creators, um, you know, Akiva Goldsmith, Alec Kurtzman, and the folks that are in charge of, of Strange New World, I think have done a really good job of mixing the old and new. And I'll be honest with you, I like I've liked every single new main character that, that they've brought in board um this show. Are you still um on the fence on I guess Palea? She she's definitely one of the major characters, maybe not main, main, but I know um I mean, she's introduced in season two and you're still thinking she's on the fence. We had a little bit more Apelia in this in this episode. So, yeah, I would yeah. say because I mean, we haven't seen her every episode. Right. Uh, and this episode, we do get a little bit more of her. I will say I think that um, m my favorite moments of her are probably in this episode. Oh, I OK. Think, yeah. I, I, I like I like that that in this episode, she is slightly different. Um, in the respect that it's just not, it's not just some goofy character they brought. I mean, Carol Kane is a fantastic comedic actress and or actress period. Um, but I was kind of concerned when they first brought her into the show that, oh, it's just going to be kind of this, what, like this plucky comic relief, you know, she's supposed to be the chief engineer. There's got to be some seriousness to it. And there was in this episode. And so mm -hmm. I was excited about that. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So, all right, let's get into this. Let's jump in uh, a couple of notes here uh, regarding this episode. Um, there is, maybe we'll kind of talk about this yeah. a little bit more maybe, but um, there there is a very touching tribute in this episode um, in regards to uh, them naming um, the nebula. And yeah, and I didn't, I, I didn't I, know that. Yeah. yeah, how that ties into real life. Yeah, and I, I didn't know that at all, but I guess that was one of the, 
um, one of the spouses of the creators that had passed. And if I, if I'm not mistaken on that, but uh, it, so the the nebula was named after Melissa Navio, who plays Lieutenant Ortega. Her her husband passed away. Uh, I don't remember if it was cancer or some illness. Uh, he passed away, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, and so they honored him by naming the nebula after him, which I thought was was really a, a touching thing. They, they they didn't have to do that, and they did, and I think it was great. Yeah, that um, was great. And without spoiling it right this second, we will we'll get into this later. But we also get the return of a of a long lost friend, and we can't wait to talk about that um, as we get into this episode. So, yeah, without further ado, we're gonna jump into this, and this episode starts off very similar to how the last episode did and how very similar to another episode before that we're getting a lot of ships personal logs in yeah, this that's right personal log with uhura right and they're going yeah. it seems like a a standard um type of mission that they're doing on going to a nebula um, and you know we find a out nebula and star trek what a nebula surprise. another <laughs> nebula in star trek and so yeah. yeah that there's a nebula there and then there's an outpost there that is supposed to collect deuterium um, and then, then there's a special sig special strategic significance of that particular outpost right because it's it's not only a jumping off jumping off space part or jumping off uh, area where they can go further in the galaxy but there's strategy in that there's recognition on the gorn or expand or expanding in the area so having that particular outpost um, to fuel their ships is strategically significant to address the potential Gorn threat that that's in the in the quadrant in the area, so I thought that was great. That was good that they're mentioning that. Yeah, we we talked about this. Um, if if you haven't watched the other reviews we've done so far of Star Trek: Strange New World season two, be sure to go down below uh, to our channel there and check out the other episodes, or they're all listed in your favorite podcast platform. If you're listening to us from there. Uh, but I believe, Chris, we mentioned this, um, the first episode of season two of Strange New Worlds, we kind of at the very end talked about some of our hopes and expectations for the season. Yes. And one of the things that I remember mentioning was uh, hoping that we would get to see more of the Gorn, right? And get to see more of this, you know, lethal enemy because they're lethal at this particular period of time in the Federation. And... There's been hints of it. I, we we haven't seen the Gorn yet, but I'm assuming in one of the later episodes of the season that we're going to get the Gorn because in the trailer you see a moment, a very brief moment, uh, where one of the crew crew members was like face to face with one. I think if I remember the trailer correctly for season two, so we're going to get it. And, and and to me, so far in Strange New Worlds, the Gorn has become one of the recurring villains. Right. I mean, you have the Klingons, obviously, but but they haven't been super prevalent in the show yet. Um, the Romulans are out there. We've seen some of the Romulans, right? In this old Romulan warbird in um tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so the Gorn are another one of those. They got there was they were only in, I think, one episode of the original series. Right. But now they're making them kind of recurring, you know, villain. I think that's great. Me too. It's another great example of you've got these canon characters or these canon species in the original series and they can take it and explore it and just really go down and and have so much more uh stories and history for these for these characters and these species that's yeah, which is excellent. amazing too yeah. because they're only doing like 10 episodes uh 10 episodes a season whereas the original series was 20 something a season <laughs> you know what i mean yeah so they're, they're doing more with less i think i was how i would put it um yeah. but yeah this this opening scene, right, where we get Uhura's personal log and and you see the Enterprise coming in this nebula. I mean, the 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 special effects were just gorgeous. I mean, the 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 view of the nebula and and that that they kind of call it like an outpost or something, but that that collector, right, that's yeah. collecting the deuterium or supposed to be collecting the deuterium, reminded me a little bit of the uh, collect the, the the collector ship from Star Trek Insurrection, right? The one that the sail uh, the ship that collect yeah. that's supposed to go through and collect all the meta metaphasic radiation stuff from the rings, which was eventually supposed to render the planet that an uninhabitable, and they didn't care that they were going to move the Baku. That ship kind of reminded me of that a little bit. Yeah, when I think about the the visual effects, I mean the visual effects in Strange New Worlds and in Picard, they're they're different. Um, yeah, both 
outstanding and Picard was so so great but what I noticed about the visual effects in Strange New Worlds is uh, I really enjoy the colors. Colors mm. are really vibrant. They they pop yeah. out and they're like, oh wow. You know, they really like complement. There's a in in all of the whether they're visual effects or whether you're thinking about the the set of the bridge um or the enterprise, it's just I, I love I love the colors that they're using. Really, really Yeah, cool. I, I would I would agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really um yeah, you got you got a lot of gloss, right, on the bridge. Yeah. But yeah. but I think everything really plays well together. You know, the set dressings, the colors, um, the the special effects, it all just seems to kind of intertwine and work really well together, which has been fantastic. It does. Um, it does. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope, oh, go ahead. So, since you said the bridge, um, I'm liking the bridge more. Does it seem like it's not as dark? Okay. That's what I'm I'm yeah, thinking, I, no, yeah. I, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, I think I mean there there's certainly more lights and buttons. Maybe is what it seems. What it seems, or that they're brighter or something. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, uh, w w Captain Pike is marveling over you know this uh, the the evolution of space and exploration and how far they've come in the last couple hundred years, right since the Vulcans touched down. And yeah. Uhura, we learn, is having uh, some some trouble sleeping. Right. Yeah. She she hasn't been sleeping well. She's having a lot of issues um, and that's affecting her sleeping. And then um, Una joins the bridge and announces that uh, Pike has been made fleet captain, which if you notice his little emblem, right, he has that like, black circle behind his comm badge. Oh, I didn't see that. You didn't notice oh, no. it. Yeah. Oh, that's great, man. It, yeah. So yeah. I, I, I when I first saw that it first opened, but before they even mentioned anything about him being a fleet captain, yeah. uh, it. I saw that and I'm like, wait a second, are they changing the emblem look for this season? Because I mean, it looked a little more like it had the, the circle behind it, like in TNG. I'm like, but they're not, they're not in the right time period to get close to starting to change that. Um, but then when they announced that, I'm like, okay. And then I saw everybody else's were the same. I'm like, Oh, this is some special badge that denotes he's a fleet captain. Um, very interesting, cool, right? Because cool. the original series introduced things like Commodores and other stuff like that that isn't really used that much in the mm -hmm. rest of Trek. So um, something like Fleet Captain, kind of the same deal. They they have maybe a little bit of a different way of of um, denoting special positions in this original series era than they do later on in in TNG and so forth. Yeah, that's cool. I'm glad you saw that because um, I totally missed that. I liked when Una came on the bridge and like one of the first things she says when she comes in bridge, she's like, Oh, Oh good. I almost missed the speech. And it just kind of, <laughs> just she kind knows of Pike well speech. enough, right? She knows yeah. him well enough. She's like, yeah, he's going to give one of his speeches because he does. And so that was kind of cute. Yeah. And then I think, I think they said something to the effect of like, Oh, it's, it's actually, it's almost over or something like that. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. yeah. So <laughs> interesting. So right off the bat, Spock notes, that this particular nebula, like you said in the beginning, Chris, has significant strategic importance, right? It, it, yeah. it, and that it appeals to Starfleet because of its proximity to Gorn space. And you see that um, that importance as we move forward, and I'm sure I'm sure it will. But it's obviously going to have some issues, even though this is an area that they want to use as a as a launching point. It's going to have some particular issues as we go throughout the episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we get, um, we also have like, so here is revealed that you know she's been having trouble sleeping, but then there's like some sort of distorted noise that she hears uh, in her earpiece. And then mm. she says, Hey, I need to share this. And then she tries replaying it back and there's nothing. So they're like, Whoa, like, and, and then that kind of starts off. Like she's not understanding. She's saying, Hey, I heard it. I heard it. She's not understanding why it's not being played back. And, then it's going, well, she's going to go to um, kind of check out the communications array and see what's wrong there. So that that kind of starts where she goes down um, to see, hey, why is this? Why is that noise? Why did this appear? Is there something wrong with the communications array? And it gets us into a little bit of uh, foreshadowing there, because as she's checking out the communications array um, and going through the steps and sequences of how to do it, you know, she's replaying back a video of the instructions with uh one of our favorite people in there yeah we yeah. get to see hammer again and if you haven't got a chance to listen to our interview with bruce horak 
who played Hammer in season one of Strange New Worlds. Uh, please go back and listen to that. Um, it was audio only at that time. And so um, you can find it on your favorite podcast platform. We did upload the audio to YouTube. So it is is on our YouTube channel, but it's audio only. So there's no video, but you can check that out. Um, it was a wonderful time we have with Bruce. He's a fantastic uh, uh, guy. And um, we really enjoyed talking with him. And I remember we had that interview. He mentioned something effective. Like, oh, the career of Bruce Horak in Star Trek is not mm -hmm. over yet. That's all I can say, though. And so um, we were we were reeling, I think, at the time that they had killed Hemmer off and were, were shocked that they that they did. We uh, Hemmer instantly became a fan favorite in season one. I know many people who said he was their favorite character from, from strange new worlds at that point. Um, and so it was wonderful to see him back. And, and we got to see a little bit of a lighter side of Hemmer as he's trying to instruct Uhura and help teach her some basic engineering concepts. He was actually making jokes. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. He wasn't as, as <clears throat> stoic and serious. And um, I, I thought that was great. There was some smile there. Like it was, it was wonderful. It was really, right. really wonderful to see, to see Bruce back as Hemmer um, in that, albeit in the video, but, but he was still, he was still there. I don't think that was filmed during season one. That was filmed when they filmed season two, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, but to see him reunited with Uhura, to me, Uhura and Hemmer's mentoring friendship relationship in season one was one of my favorite relationships from the first season. Yeah, because she's got all of that um, self-doubt Right, that yep. she's she's going. Yeah, she was through, a cadet right? still. Yeah, a cadet, and not sure uh, what her future career in Starfleet was all going to be about. And you know, he is really encouraging, and like ha she, you know, from her their relationship, she does a lot of self reflection, and he really, really kind of propels her like along the way. You know, this scene, uh, what I like about cause she's Uhura is watching the the video, the step by step video instructions there, and I think it's pretty close. I'm not sure they're quite in the same exact scene but then you have Halia kind of seeing Uhura right there and says hey what are you doing um and this is I think immediately after Uhura is like watching the video so they might I'm not quite sure I'd have to see it again but Palea and and Hammer might be in the same frame so you might have the the original engineer and the new engineer I'm not quite sure if they exactly in the same frame, but they might be in, in a weird kind of way. So, yeah, it could be pretty close. Yeah, it, it could be. And it's interesting because you, you see Pelia come in here. Right. And she's pretty she's kind of kind of rude because Uhura is watching the video. She's learning. But you can also tell that she's reflecting back mm -hmm. on on Hemmer and her friendship with Hemmer. Uh, there's a there's a part of me is hoping that that Hemmer didn't really die and they'd they'd be able to resurrect because nobody really dies in Star Trek, right. do they? Um, you know, so there's always a way to bring him back. It, it, I just I was hoping there was a part of me that's hoping, but um, but she she's pretty blunt when she says about Hemmer that oh he was just an okay engineer, right? And that that doesn't that doesn't sit well with Uhura. Um, that there there's definitely tension because. I think Pelias is something in the effect of like, oh, you haven't even spoken to me since I came on board the ship yeah. or whatever. And Uhura's like, oh, I, I haven't? Like, I, I've i just been really busy. And she's like, no, no, no. Well, I, I okay, well, yeah, maybe maybe I haven't or whatever, how the conversation goes. But you could just tell, like, Uhura's not really keen on wanting to get to know Pelia. I'm sure she sees Pelia as just the replacement for her friend yeah. who was the engineer. Um, yeah. I, I'll be honest with you, like, I think the 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 thing I have hated the most about Strange New Worlds has probably been the fact that they killed Hemmer off. Like I would have loved to have seen Hemmer continue on as one of the main cast members for several, at least several seasons, and not just killed off the way he was. I I, I get what he, I get. Like you know, Bruce mentioned he just want when when he found out he found out very early on, but he just wanted a hero's death. He didn't. Want, yeah. I remember him saying to us something effective like he didn't he didn't want to go. Oh, what's this do? And then blow up or whatever. You know. Um. So. I, it would have been, yeah. I, I think, I think them killing off Hemmer when they did was a huge missed opportunity to continue that character on because he was such a fan favorite, and they and they kind yeah. of built the character up as a fan favorite, and then they killed him. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. He was he was great and such a unique character, right? Because there yeah. had never there had never been a. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to get the species wrong again. He's not Andorian. He's uh, Enar. Enar, thank you. Yeah, Enar is 
is Andorian, but it's like a subspecies of Andorian, you know, uh, yeah. they're like albino, they're blind, they live in the mountains. Uh, it's a callback to, to Enterprise, right? That's the first time you ever meet the Enar is in Star Trek Enterprise because we learn a lot about Andorians and Tellarites and, and Enterprise that we never knew before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you, you what's interesting to Paleo's to Paleo's credit, because Paley is coming onto the ship, like understanding that the chief engineer had had passed away, right? That understanding there was tragedy there. But to Paleo's credit, she is um she's outspoken and outright, you know, to to Uhura. She's like, hey, why don't you ever, you know, said anything to me? Like said hello. And then later on in the episode, um, you know, she has a similar more uh intense interaction with with una um but it's it's you know very very similar concept so to paleo's credit she's she's understanding this and she's coming to the situation and and uh she knows there's a shadow like over her nat nat naturally um but yeah. she want, wants people to go hey i'm here it's okay you know it's okay i'm here and i'm gonna be part part of the crew and a little bit um you know she's doing that for the audience too because you're right we loved we love hammer um, and he's one of our favorites, but she's also for the audience. She's like, it's okay. I'm, I'm here. I've got my own kind of, uh, take on things. I've got my own brand, but I'm going to be part of, part of things. So, um, yeah, I, I, I like that. Yeah, I do uh, too. Yeah. So we, we, we go from this tense situation to seeing Pike and Una and they're walking, you know, through the halls of the ship. And they're talking about this deuterium station, which we find out was supposed to have already been online and collecting things and, mm -hmm. and, and collecting this fuel for ships as like a basically like a refueling station right for 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 uh starfleet and um that there were some type of issues so uh una was is then assigned by pike to help clean up the mess and yeah. una's got a, a a bit of a no nonsense style of leadership right and so i think pike pike obviously knows that because he knows her well and so he thinks she's the right person for the job and then in the turbo lift, Uhura hears that signal again. This some kind of distorted signal, and this is also this is also a moment where she ends up seeing what looks like a dead zombie-like version of Hemmer. A very very uh, dis disconcerting. Whatever, what, no, that's not the right term. Um, it's it's very um, you know gross yeah. i mean it's it's kind of it's gross you know but it's it's very uh uh unsettling that's what i'm looking for yeah that is it is unsettling did you um when i when we looked at hammer and kind of that zombie version of hammer this is what i saw when i see if you saw, saw the same thing but like his his chest right here um it looked like you know you would okay so there looked like there was um injury like on his chest like similar to what a gorn would do uh that we learned about from season one like uh, when a Gorn does that, so uh, that's what I noticed. Um, did you notice the same thing? I did. Yes. Uh, that and it would make sense, right? Because yeah. potentially, as his body is falling, maybe down or, or after the body hits the ground, that the the Gorn babies on the inside survive and they burst out of his chest, kind of like aliens, right? Yeah. Um, and and they run off and go do whatever on that planet where they found him. So yeah, that. That makes sense. I mean, that to me is is really good continuity amongst the staff of the show because they're like, hey, you know, he died, he fell. And so, of course, his face is all grossed up, but but also he would have died by these things popping out of his chest. So yeah. that makes sense. Um, and then we we jump to sick bay, Chris, and and uh Dr. Mbenga is, is looking over Uhura and uh, basically says, look. The reason you had these hallucinations was you got a, a mild form of deuterium poisoning when you were, you know, down there, um, you know, trying to figure things out um, in engineering uh, while working on the nacelle. Yeah. And so uh, she was exposed to some, uh, you know, a small amount of this, but, uh, you know, a, a enough exposure to it can be deadly. And so she, she got, uh, you know, a decent exposure to it um, while working down there. And uh, between that, she hasn't been sleeping well. She's exhausted. Uh, Dr. Mbenga pretty much concludes, look, like you're, you know, you're run ragged. You haven't been sleeping. Uh, you're exhausted. You had this deuterium poisoning. So all of this together, uh, your, your orders are you're going to bed. You're going to go get yeah. some sleep, right? 
Um, and you're not allowed to go back to, to duty until I say so until, you know, you've had enough rest and I can, I can tell that you're well rested. Um, it's, it's a classic thing in Trek for the doctors to order crew members to rest or something. And they, they always say, I have the ultimate authority on that. I, not even the captain can override me and all this stuff. And so, um, but then we jump to the station mm -hmm. where Una and Pelia are trying to get up to speed and get the uh the uh station up and running and i really like that now we've got some interaction with with uni and pelia and they're very very different personalities for sure you know yeah you're, you're right una is uh very much uh no nonsense step by step uh yep. very quick you know very very deliberate and logical about uh making decisions <laughs> and Pe Pele is kind of She's extremely intelligent, very wise, has long and she's old. She's right? Old. She's been around a long time, <laughs> but like all you know, all all over the place. Um, so I like those contrasts of styles, and they definitely clash because because Una's you know saying, "Hey, let's look at this system, look at that system, look at the system," and Peli is uh, going, "Hey, something's out of touch here. Something's something strange," um, and Una is not really liking you know that the kind of questioning that that Pelia brings um and it was either in this it was either this scene or a scene a little bit uh later in here where i love what una says because it was it was it was pretty funny she's like essentially calling out Pelia as like you're just you're just like a space hippie something like that so <laughs> yeah uh, okay that's good that's, that's uh good. yeah well i mean they know right i mean so yeah. so we learned from the first episode that Pelia shows up right that she's mm -hmm. a lanthanite mm -hmm. and we didn't yeah. know much about them. And then we learn, I think it's in the episode tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow where we learn like they, 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 they can live for, you know, long, long time. Yeah. Um, I don't remember which episode, maybe, maybe it was the first episode she was in. We, we, yeah, well, I think it was the first episode Pelia was in that we learned that. And then you see that play out again in tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow where she's alive back in, you know, 2024 yeah um, as a as, as the in the archaeology department right selling bait like a pawn shop almost yeah um yeah, yeah. but but yeah That's so good. so you have this this many many lifetimes of experience clashing with somebody who is significantly younger obviously than her and i i, I i'm gonna make a ds9 reference again oh, here. Oh. i apologize but you see that sometimes play out with Dax, right? And all these yeah. six, seven lifetimes worth of experience versus some of these other people she runs into, even friends. So she's like, I've got X number of lifetimes of experience. And so you see the same thing with Pelia, right? She's got this vast wealth of knowledge from living all these years and living all the 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 centuries mm -hmm. among humans. Um, and and Una's not really having it. Yeah, that's right. I, I think I'd find I think I'd probably feel the same as Una <laughs> just a little bit in that circumstance. So that's okay. Yeah, space hippie. That was funny. Yeah, that was yeah. that was funny. That was funny. So we do have so as uh as Uhura um is trying to get rest, is which is very unrestful rest, you know, she but she's trying to obey Dr. Mbanga's orders. We have her go through and I don't remember if this is a dream sequence or if it's a hallucination, but we see that she's on a on a planet and we see um, like smoke uh, that's kind of in the distance. And we I mean, we learn we learn later that this is a shuttle accident that her family is in, involved in. So she's kind of being transported to this to this the scene here and reliving it here. And you can see kind of that fear and that concern like in in her eyes um, as she's seeing this vision, she's seeing this hallucination. Now this this aspect of the shuttle ac accident with Uhura, I think, is brand new for us in regards to Uhura's character. I I was trying to think back on, hey, was was that aspect of her character ever explored in Star Trek ever before or mentioned ever before? But I think this is all new for for Strange New Worlds. Is is um, this this part of her character and in, in the shuttle I, accident? I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, so, so I think that that was good. That was good and an original for the creators to do for this show. And again, like we like, we're just we're learning a lot more and we're getting a lot more backstory and originality on these characters that that we love. 
which brings us to like another character that's in canon, another character that we love, and then more backstory on these characters. But we have we have James Kirk coming mm. back on and beaming uh, on the Enterprise, and you know not only James Kirk, but we've got his brother George George Kirk um, on the Enterprise too, and the interaction that goes by Sam. Them. Goes yeah, by Sam, we, yeah, yeah. We've met Sam before. I think I think he he did appear in I want to say in season one, because they kind of teased it like, oh, it's Lieutenant Kirk, and everybody's like, oh, mm-hmm. James Kirk, and then like, no, no, Sam Kirk. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure he was in season one. I think we've seen him again in this season prior to to James T. Kirk showing up. You're right. And do you? I think this is the first time that the brothers meet up. Or, I th- that we're that we're seeing. I think so. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we had the, you know, the, the kind of alternate universe with, with, with Lon and, and, and Kirk in tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and where yeah. he's captain of the enterprise. But, and I think Sam was on that, but, um, this in, in the normal timeline, mm-hmm. normal universe, I think this, I think you're right. Yeah. Which is cool. So that's good because when they do meet up, cause they, they meet up there, they get to go to the, the bar and, and catch up but when they do meet up we get a little bit more insight into both of them and get insight a little bit of insight into the father too which i think was a great way to kind of explore this backstory and and, and explore the canon right so um so you said that's right sam sam's first name is actually george and sam named after is their father yep. uh, yeah he's actually the one named after the father and we learn more about the father in their conversation right the the father was uh, first officer of the uh, uh let me get this name of the ship Kel- kelvin yeah kelvin yeah yeah and uh, which is which is a reference to the jj movies again that's right? right because the only time we ever see kirk's dad i believe in star trek the first time is in that first star trek jj movie yeah it, with with chris hemsworth before he became thor right a young chris hemsworth played george kirk saved yeah. the ship now that that was a different timeline that was disrupted by uh this romulan mining ship that that travels back in time and destroys everything basically um but that's that's kind of it's a harken back to to that yeah 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 so it is that's a great that's a great harken back to that so in their conversation you know a little bit about their father and them understanding hey what what does our father think is um considered like being successful um which is great. And there's very, very different ideas of that, right? So we learn about Kirk and Kirk actually mentions that his ambition um, because there's a little bit of a, I'd say a a little bit of envy from, from Sam. Yeah. If I could characterize it that way, right? Because a little jealousy. Yeah. 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 I mean, Kirk is um, the youngest first officer like ever. He had just been promoted has just been promoted to first officer for the Farragut and is the youngest ever in Starfleet. Um, and, you know, Kirk has worked hard for it. Um, but Sam feels that Kirk doesn't really acknowledge, like, all of the work that Sam has done with xenobiology. Right? They're on different paths, but... Yeah, I, I think I think James T. Kirk kind of looks down upon it a little bit, like, "Oh, how's that going? Oh, that's real exciting, you know." Like, just yeah. it's kind of uh, it's it's boring. It's not. I, I think I initially uh, James Kirk looks at Sam like you know, uh, basically in so many words, like it sucks. You know, you're not as ambitious as me. I've been more ambitious. I've been more fast burning. You're happy doing your sciency stuff in some lab somewhere and that's not the route I chose to take. And so James T Kirk it's mentioned and, and hinted upon that, that James Kirk is much more like his father. Yeah. Right. Super ambitious, like Starfleet is life. Like that the, he, 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 of course he doesn't have a family like, like George did, but um, he has a kind of similar path, career path to what his dad is, what his dad did similar, not exactly. Cause his dad wasn't, the same as fast burning but the ambition certainly yeah the ambition certainly i uh so this particular episode i grew to like sam even more i thought oh okay you know he's you know he's he's different he's he's a scientist but completely different than his brother james and uh, james kirk i did like in this one because it, it 
hit kind of the core being of who Kirk is, right? He's just, he's a, he's, he's good. He's, he's got great values. He's a good person. He's also like super, super ambitious. And, and we've seen his, um, he, we have seen his ambition, um, like be a detriment to other things like in, in his life. You know, his, his own like personal an- ambition has hurt him in other ways in his life. So, yeah. so I thought that, True. Was good. that was good. Great scene between the brothers. I thought it was good. Yeah. yeah. And Sam definitely has an epic mustache. So we got to <laughs> make, sure, make sure we point that out. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Yeah. So great interaction between them. But then we, we have this really, really, I think, uh, endearing interaction. It's a brief one, but we've got it between Nurse Chapel and and Spock there. That was that was great when they're playing. I, 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 I thought you might like this scene. Uh, I sure do. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, Spock, Spock is uh, essentially uh, asking very nicely, like if they should make their relationship public. And so that that was that was great. And there's Chapel's like, no, not yet. Let's let's see where it goes. It kind of reminds me of like, you know, for those kids nowadays, like mm-hmm. back in the day when you're like, oh, you want to go steady? Like you want to be boyfriend and girlfriend, you know? And now, and I guess nowadays, well, maybe not even nowadays anymore, but but even like when Facebook first came around, it's like, oh, you want to make it Facebook official, right? Like oh, it's Facebook almost, official. It's, yeah, it's yeah. like, it's almost like Spock and in, in, in uh, Chapel are like, oh, should we make this enterprise official? You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, that's only, what I was thinking. They're trying to go. Want, do you want to go steady or not, or what? You know. Yeah, it was good. And only in Star Trek will they make. Uh, will they make that like? Hey, will they compare making a relationship public to quantum entanglement? They're <laughs> yeah. able to do that successfully. So yeah, <laughs> that was good. Yep. Um, yeah, that was that was that was cute. But um, a lot of uh, what we see next is we get Kirk meeting Uhura for the first time and they've got kind of a, uh, you know, a funny, funny interaction too, but because the rest of this episode really is about, well, not only about it, but, but there's a great connection between Kirk and Uhura and Kirk believing in Uhura and kind of supporting her through the rest of the episode. So the first interaction was pretty funny where uh, Uhura thought, Oh, is you know, he just hitting on me. So she doesn't want like Kirk hitting on her, which is, He's not, he's absolutely not heating on her. He's just like, Hey, you know, how you going? Like, look like you could use someone to talk to. And he's yeah, like, he, even he mentioned, he's like, you sat down next to me. Yeah. I didn't come over to you. You know what I mean? So they're, they're, they're hinting at the idea that, that Kirk is going to become this kind of ladies man, this, 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 this guy, this, this officer who has a reputation of going after the ladies, right? Which we all know that to be true and from toss. So yeah. yeah and that was cute. But he was innocent. In it. He was yeah. totally innocent in that, right? Hundred yeah. so, percent. I don't 100%. think there was one inkling of him trying to hit on Uhura in that scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, but th- things kind of go on, and as um, Uhura kind of leaves the bar, then she has this other vision. Um, it's kind of a disturbing vision because there's a lot of uh, bodies that are outside in the in the ship's hallway, and then so she, in her vision, there's this. Uh, other violent version of herself that she gets into a fight with her of herself and there's this 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 uh fight and i think that other version has a knife but anyway she en- she ends up like hit- hitting herself and then we flash back outside of the vision and she's knocked kirk down and kirk's on the floor and he's going ow and she's either she's kind of uh cut him on the nose right there so that that was good um and and this is where kirk becomes more concerned because he's like hey doesn't look like everything's all right. It looks like you were seeing things. Um, like w- what's going on? Um, and he doesn't want her to get in trouble. So I thought that was a good part, like uh, about Kirk, because he's showing his, uh, you know, his he's always concerned about his friends. He's concerned about his crew, and so we see that. So Hora, of course, like takes him back, and they do the dermal regeneration on on him. So, good. Yeah. And so Uhura apologizes, she does the re- dermal regeneration, and um, you know she she we kind of start going down this rabbit hole uh, mm-hmm. with her trying to figure out what's causing these nightmares. And you know she hasn't found anything, any anomalies in the nebula that would suggest why. And we've seen nebulas give people issues in the past. TNG, I believe, had a couple episodes. Uh, and one in particular that I'm thinking of with with Counselor Troy, where she starts to have, I think it's like night terrors or whatever. Yeah. Right? 
things start affecting the crew. So this isn't the first time we've seen a nebula affect the crew of a ship in Star Trek. Uh, and Kirk then takes Kirk, Kirk's Kirk's an investigative type person, right? He wants to get to the bottom of stuff and solve things. And so you see that here, right? Where he takes the medical file, looking at her symptoms and trying to figure out like, Hey, is anybody on the Farragut? Maybe there's somebody in the Farragut dealing with the same issues and we can compare and contrast and figure out if she's not the only one going through this. And uh, so we then jump back to the, the station and uh, Una and Pelia are trying to investigate what appears to be sabotage that right. happened on the ship as to why this thing isn't up and running, right? And they find this young officer in a corner. You could tell he's scared out of his mind. He seems to be, you know, not quite all there. And uh, he, it doesn't seem like he really knows what's real and what isn't. Um, and apparently uh, his name is, uh, is it? Ramon. Did he pronounce it Ramon? Yeah, I think that's what I believe it was. so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, of course, Una instantly, in her style, right, starts to question, "Well, why did why did you sabotage the station?" And he didn't think the station was real. And yeah. maybe you know, we this is where we start to say, okay, maybe there's somebody else now who is suffering from the same things that Uhura is suffering from. As an audience, we're we're starting to maybe kind of start putting some pieces together here a little bit. And so they, they asked for, you know, medical emergency, had the enterprise being this guy up and, and so forth. And then uh, we jump back to the enterprise. Kirk has left um, Una and well, that's yeah. when, yeah. And that's when the ship kicks into red alert. Una runs to the bridge and they're getting it, uh, some kind of attack from an enemy ship. The view screen cracks it explodes and everybody's sucked out into space. And then all of a sudden she wakes up out of that hallucination and she's on the bridge and everything's fine. Um, and so this is just one more, I don't want to say night nightmare, night terror hallucination, basically that, that, uh, that Una is, is dealing with. Yeah. And, and I believe during that time too, I think she also hears the, the noise again. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. That noise is kind of a, that noise is a backdrop throughout the the whole episode, and um, you know, come come to think about that noise and and the episode, I'm not sure. I'm just assuming that that is the noise of the of how. Um, I mean, we we learn later where that's that there's aliens involved in this, but I'm just assuming that's the noise of the raw communication that they're hearing. Yeah. In in general, I like the. Um, the kind of the mechanism where there's these hallucin you know these hallucinations are happening to the crew um and I, and I like the the tension and the fear that that causes in the episode right because they're like hey what's going on what's happening you don't really know what's going to happen next it puts not only the um it, it puts the audience in this state of like anticipation like and kind of wondering okay what's behind all of this um, and I and I think that's kind of a great like mechanism that they do. You know, you you hit it on the head that they've done it in in TNG before, and I I liked how they do, they've done it in TNG before, and this is another you know evolution of how they do it in Strange New World. So it's a nice mechanism. Yeah, and I I don't know if you felt this way, Chris, but this episode to me felt very much in the uh, horror crossover, like we saw with um, in season one with the episode where Hammer dies in the Gorn. I yeah, feel like we have another whole kind of like a semi horror crossover episode here. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same. Now, in the one in the episode with the Gorn, um, I could watch that like over and over because that that was very you know, very much horror, horror, horror. I mean, yeah, it was so alien esque. Yeah, it was. You had that crew member at the beginning. I think that crew member had a birthday or something like that, and then he was one of the ones that met his demise with the Gorn. Like when they mm -hmm. when they go and investigate that ship, they did a great job with that episode. Now we must point out here with Ramon, he's a red shirt. Ah, uh, yes, he is a red shirt. So take that for what it's worth. <laughs> he's Unfortunately, he will meet his demise. But he will meet his demise. He will which, meet which which is which is common from this this era of Star Trek. Lots of red shirts died. Not only red shirts died, other other you know blue and yellow shirts died as well. But a lot of red shirts die, and this happens to be 
one of those. Um, but so we in sick bay, Dr. Mbenga is examining him and uh, it, it, it obviously they start to connect the dots where he starts to have these almost looks like headaches. He starts to hear mm-hmm. something. Uhura starts to hear the sound at the same time. And unfortunately, we are given the impression that whatever is going on with him and whatever is going on with Uhura, that he is more it's more advanced than him. You know, mm-hmm. things are, are impacting him more heavily now. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, this sound that's happening, Ramon attacks them all and runs out the room in fact i think he takes i don't remember what what it is that he had in his hand something he's like slashes that doctor and benga and cuts him on the chest yeah um, not, not not significantly where doctor and benga is you know gonna die or anything but but you know good gash and then runs out of the room and um uhura is starting to think oh well maybe this is another another hallucination that's going on but unfortunately, Kirk's like, no, 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 this is this is real. You know, like he this is this is definitely going on. And then so we then see Pike, Kirk and Uhura, you know, spread out and try to find Ramon on the Enterprise. Yeah, they, they do. It was a kind of a I thought it was a night a nice like manhunt um, like little scene that they do. And eventually it is. Eventually, it is Uhura that find, you know, of course, it's going to be Uhura that finds Ramon Um trying to i think he's he's trying to deactivate the the nacelles or do I think, yeah I he's in the nacelle was, again yeah. and he is trying yeah he's trying to he's trying to make it so that they can't they're not collecting the deuter, the, the deuterium i can't even say that deuterium anymore yeah yeah so he's causing some sort of over, overload some sort of system malfunction um and she ends up getting into a uh you know a, a, she's trying to convince Ramon that hey it's okay I'm here my name is Uhura you're, you're gonna be okay um, but that's not working right he's still very very dangerous uh, the ship's gonna not the ship but the the cells are, uh, that part of the nacelle is gonna blow up and we've got Kirk Kirk gets there just in the nick of time he's able to get to Uhura he says emergency beam out they're able to do that and and you see Ramon blown out of the ship and I thought that was a, a visual for visual effects I thought that was a great visual effect he gets blown on the ship and then you see him freeze there. So his insanity has kind of driven him all to that part. But this goes back to that episode when 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 Lon and, and Dr. Mbenga are, are are like they let <laughs> themselves out of the ship, right? And they're they're wearing some stuff, but not enough to keep them from experience a vacuum of space. They have like 15 seconds or whatever and they survive, right? But yet this dude blows out the the freaking nacelle into space and he's dead right away. There, that's I'm sorry, that's too inconsistent. They either they die when they hit the vacuum of space, which I believe is science would be more scientifically accurate, or they don't. But why is why is the random red shirt the one that dies instantly? But the two main characters, of course, they don't die. I have a big beef with this. When I, as soon as there I saw go. that scene, my instant thought was, okay, so Lon and Doctor Mbenga survive. Thankfully, they do. But the 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 random red shirt Ramon doesn't. What's up with that? Yeah. Anybody else feeling that? Anybody else watching or listening, feeling like this random red shirt guy got the shaft? I do. (laughs) (laughs) We have to stand up for the red shirts. We do. We do. That we are the random red shirts. Yeah. When a random red shirt dies, we must revolt. I swear. We must. (laughs) I I was not too keen on this scene, I'll be honest with you. No, that was good. Oh, that was good. That was great finding that inconsistency there. Yeah, it was. Soup definitely an inconsistency. Yeah. So he's he's gone. I, I and what I mean, that was kind of a big explosion, I felt for for the Enterprise. And it seems like they didn't really revisit that. Like there wasn't yeah, the a lot they of they had a, a big chunk of their nacelle taken. I, I'm sorry, but if, if a nacelle blows a huge chunk in it right near the bussard collectors, I'm pretty sure that that would cause some type of chain reaction that probably would have obliterated at least half the ship. So that that's another beef I have. The explosion in that, I'm sorry, I don't believe that that was limited to just that area. I have a feeling that, especially in this era, that would have caused massive damage to the ship, almost mm-hmm. to the point of being unrepairable, or that you know they would have to, you know, emergency evacuate and get to the escape pods and all that. I I, I don't believe that 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 explosion would have been limited to just that upper you know front part of that nacelle yeah yeah so those those are good inconsistencies that we pointed out 
it was good that we pointed them out, but they were bad. Yes. <laughs> there is a nice scene like a- after this, there's a nice scene. And I think it was, it was great that we had it because it calls back to the tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow episode. But while Uhura, you know, <clears throat> while Uhura's in sick bay being taken care of, you know, Kirk um, comes out of sick bay and he runs into Leon and, I think that was a nice, sincere scene because you, you know, Leon's all, Leon remembers everything, right? <clears throat> and then this yeah. is this is this is this alternate version of Kirk here in the in the standard kind of timeline, but uh, Leon has this very, um, I think, great conversation with him. Um, she's kind of exploring like who he is right there, um, and Kirk's Kirk's pretty open open right there, and she kind of realizes, hey, it's the same. I think Leon realizes, hey, this is the same person kind of that that I really grew to like, grew to love in that tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow episode. So um, I don't know what you what you felt about that, but I, I thought it was some I thought it was really nice. Yeah, uh, I like that we're getting the this kind of traditional new adventure every week, standalone episode toss era style that they're doing with Strange New Worlds. But I also like that they're mixing in the fact that while they're doing these individual episodes, Episodes. They're mm-hmm. also doing callbacks to other episodes, so it's not quite a continual story arc. Uh, every episode is completely tied to the next one, kind of thing. But I like that they are tying in and referencing back to other episodes to let you know, hey, while these are individual episodes, this is a continual, you know, thing. This the, the development of these characters and the relationships and everything is being built one episode at a time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they get a little bit more into exploring and understanding what's happening in the mystery. You know, like uh, uh, Uhura and Kirk, they're exploring through more of Ramon's files now. So they get his medical, medical files to kind of understand what's going on with him. Um, you know, and sh- we then then we learn more that from Uhura's on Uhura's end that we learn more about her family and the shuttle accident right there. And she's explaining that that to Kirk. And we learn more about Uhura and her relationship with Hemmer, um, and that Hemmer was, like like we said before, like the the mentor right there. And so, yeah. um, I thought that was all. Those were all good callbacks and necessary, right, for for us to acknowledge that re- relationship that Hemmer has had with with everybody. But in all of these. Um, and all of these things that are happening, they start to put the dots together, like Uhura and, and Kirk, and start to put the dots to, together. And they think they meet with Sam at the same time too. To, and there's a little bit of um, of great of kind of connection because Sam is totally involved in xenobiology, and so of course Sam's going to be the one to kind of um, show them the picture of like, hey, maybe we've got some aliens here. Um, and, and then who is like, well, maybe these aliens are trying to communicate in some way. So as they're kind of investigating this, um, you know, they're coming to that conclusion, which a little bit like makes me feel like, uh, Scooby-Doo a little bit, cause you've got this gang and they're trying to understand, like, uh, put together these clues on what's happening. Um, and the, the nature of the aliens I thought was, uh, was in, I think interesting is probably the word to say because Sam's like, well, there could be interdimensional beings and they attach themselves to atoms like in, in our dimension. I think it was something like that. And yeah, I, I don't really I'm not really a fan of the way they just like they, they just kind of made it so vague. You don't really get a good understanding of what they are. Yeah. It's just like, oh, they could be these things. It could not be these things. We can't see them. We don't know really what they are, but they're there. It's like they're there because uhura somehow is able to translate her hallucinations into them attempting to speak to her through memories right and that's how they're communicating but i i just kind of wish they would have given us a little flushed out the aliens a little bit more maybe tried to some way figure out how to identify them and that they're there be able to scan for them because how what's to say that this doesn't happen again you know um yeah they did the same thing the last episode in episode five, right? You have this, these, these aliens, they call colors like yellow and blue and red and that. uh, Yeah. I don't know. Uh, 
I haven't been super impressed with they're introducing new alien type species and things, but yet they're, they're very vague on what they are and you don't really know a ton about them, which is not the end of the world, but I just kind of wish we would, they would have given us a little bit more than, Oh, they might be these things. Yeah. yeah Cause I, I think there was a big leap from them thinking, Oh, cause, Oh, these are aliens. Oh, this is how they're communicating to me. They're communicating to me in these visions and my memories and then taking those visions and memories and then, and then she translates them to, oh, we're killing them by collecting the deuterium and we're torturing them and then therefore we need, we need to stop. It was very specific, I felt. And I was like, well, that was a big that yeah. was a big leap from there. I don't know if that I would be able to make that same. It's that almost like they rushed it. Like, oh, we got to hurry up and rush it and get this, to wrap the episode up. So, oh, yeah, it means this. Yeah. So you're right. I think that's a good point. It was kind of it was a pretty big, pretty big leap. To yeah. go from knowing nothing at all and just I'm having these hallucinations and maybe I need sleep and I have deuterium poisoning to, oh, this is what they are. This is what they're trying to do. And now I understand everything they're saying. Yeah, because the next step that she's got to do is then she calls Pike and says, oh, um, Captain Pike, well, you know, we're we're killing them and we're hurting them. and We've got to shut down the deuterium collectors and we've got to stop all this. And um, and he's like, well, we can't. And she says, well, we've got to shut it down. And it's life or death. Now it's life or death. Yeah. Right. And so because the next decision is, well, I guess we have to destroy the destroy the outpost. Yeah. And OK, so obviously we see some some significant amount of trust between Pike yeah. and Uhura. But don't you think with the significant strategic value of this location and the, the stepping off point to continue exploration for other parts of the galaxy, that if Pike took and Pike said he takes the responsibility for the choice, right, of destroying this to this deuterium collector don't you think starfleet would be really pissed off yeah like really angry uh, a, 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 and his explanation is oh well we think there's these aliens and they they communicated to my comm officer through uh hallucinations and this other guy who blew himself out of a nacelle that didn't destroy our ship and yeah we had to blow it up no they're not, they're not gonna sit there and go oh okay i have a feeling this would be this would be a a a a bad mark on Pike. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that, especially where, you know, we're not really sure that they collected enough evidence, I would say. Yeah. Um, right. And so they have no evidence. They just, they, they have to go off of two people's hallucinations basically. Yeah. So you'd want a little bit of more study, I think there or scans or something or, or a little bit yeah. more evidence, a little bit more proof, but yeah. yeah. And, and, and honestly, I feel like in order to flush this out more, they could have, I mean, they weren't going to because this this show isn't set up this way, but they almost could have made like a two parter, uh -huh. like a Voyager yeah. style two parter, right? Where you yeah. get you get more. They the I I definitely think there could have been enough here to do that. Yeah, there there could have been there could have been when Uhura goes to the bridge, um, because you know she's saying, "Hey, shut it down! You gotta destroy it." When she goes to the bridge, she has the other uh, hallucination in front of her, like as she's there and as she's talking to Pike uh, with Hammer. And I yeah. thought that was zombie hammer, zombie hammer at, yeah. at first. Right. And so, um, and he looks very menacing. I think the zombie hammer looked menacing. Yeah. Um, and then as they destroy the collector and as they stop the collection of the deuterium, you know, he transforms into regular hammer. And I thought that was a sweet moment too, right? Just his smile and his nod, you know, essentially did it work? I think Pike, someone asks, did it work? I think Pike asks, Hey, did it work? Um, yeah, and you see him smile there, and then then you see a basically a restored hammer, right? A full yeah. hammer, and you see that lovely smile of his, and then he he disappears. Um, and that was that was touching. That was really awesome to see Hammer, you know, show back up, um, like that, and and be, be that kind of vessel, you know, for because because they they could have chosen any number of things. They they could have they could have actually had Uhura's family in in place of Hammer you know, as the way in which they were communicating because obviously they were important to her as well, but they chose Hemmer, which I thought was great because of the connection that, that Hemmer and Uhura had in their relationship. Yeah. And that smile made me feel not only was it a smile to Uhura, but I felt like it was a smile to, to us, the audience. I felt like yeah. he smiled and he's like, Hey everyone, it's going to be okay. Then I felt like it was personal to me. Like when, yeah. when he did that. So um, 
it was wonderful. I, I hope we're able to have Bruce back on and talk about that and talk about coming back on and, and filming that. And I, I hope this is not the last time we see Hammer, especially mm-hmm. where they u- they use it in such a good way, I think, where you had this this video where Uhura is learning something and watching Hammer explain. Maybe there'll be another opportunity for her to continue to learn engineering skills or learn other things that and, and use these these kind of tutorial videos that that were apparently made with hammer and in order to use that to to learn we get more opportunities or maybe we get a flashback with hammer and uhura again um i i hope that we get more of that yeah me too me too i i, I don't want to forget the um because there's a little bit of act this is involves hammer too but there's that little bit of interaction between palea and una as they're coming back on, on yeah. the enterprise right mm-hmm. um and to palea's credit she's essentially like calling out Una, Una again um, because Una says, hey, my Una says, hey, you gave me a C in whatever class and and Paleo digs, dig, keeps digging and digging and digging and um, to go, no, I don't think that's the reason. It's because, you know, because of Hammer, you know, you think I'm just trying to replace Hammer and it's not it's not that. Um, and I thought that was great because that acknowledges that acknowledges how important Hammer was to everybody. And so quickly, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. He became a fan favorite. He, he, he built these relationships so quickly with the rest of the crew that um, you're beginning to see the effects of that. Yeah. Yeah. This was good. Yeah. And I, th- I like the explanation that, you know, it's, it's, she, she says, Oh, I'm angry at you, whatever, because you gave me a C in starship maintenance at the Academy. Yeah. And so we also, we also learned that Una knows Pelia from, before she came on board because she was her professor, right? So we know Pelia was at the Academy for a long time as, as a professor and has been around for a while. And that really, like you said, the, she, she's pretty insightful having lived so long. She can, she can probably read people pretty well now. And that, that the real reason is because she looks at Pelia as if she's a replacement for Hemmer. And that's not the case. So, but then she's like, "Well, well, don't worry. I'll, 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 I'll go along with this idea that you're, you're upset at me because of the sea and starship maintenance." Which I thought was, you know, uh, she, she's showing empathy, right, towards, towards Una, knowing that, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I understand, I can understand where you're coming from, but at the same time, um, I, I'm willing to, to kind of go along with it too. So, and kind yeah. of, you know, a, appeal to her, to her feelings. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's good. Some of our closing scenes in the episode, um, we've got Uhura and Kirk. I think at ten four. I think they call it ten forward. It's the bar, whatever. I'm not sure yeah, they've actually yeah, said their their lounge area. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is a beautiful lounge area. And then we've got. Um, Did you notice the chairs though in there? Some of those the, the chairs in there look just like the ones on the original series, except they're oh. white and not blue. Same exact style, that 60 style yeah. era chair. Um, and, and of course, there's also a call to uh, Saurian Brandy, yes. right? Uh, uh, Uhura orders a Saurian Brandy, which we know is one of Kirk's favorite drinks. Yeah, that's right. That's good. That's good. Yeah. We've got Spock, you know, Spock comes in too, and then we've got the meeting. We've got, I think, Spock and Kirk shaking hands. Uh, yeah, like I believe this is the first time that they actually meet. Yeah, the first time that they actually so a lot of foreshadowing there. Yeah. Which um which gets me into a little bit of thought, like as as we kind of were, we're talking about our our overall thoughts of the episode. And I, I wonder I mean it was great. I like Kirk. Um and I like that Kirk meets meets Spock. And I think that was good. Um but I don't know if that takes anything away from Strange New Worlds and and Pike's crew and Pike's ship being its own its own thing too, um, you know, because Toss is its own thing and there's that old whole dynamic. But I don't think it took anything away too much from the episode, but it just got me thinking along, along those lines. Yeah. Uh, so I I liked before we get into our, our, our final thoughts here as we wrap this up, I, I liked the scene between Sam and Kirk. Yeah. Um. Right. So Sam, Sam basically tries to be the bigger man and come up and says, you know what, Jim? I'm happy for you. I'm happy that, you know, all this happened and everything. Right. And, yeah. and, um, uh, Kirk's like taken aback and surprised. It's obviously that him and Sam, you know, they don't quite see eye to eye. They, they definitely have their, their sibling issues. Um, but, but Kirk, while he takes the compliment, he then immediately is kind of like rolls his eyes, metaphorically speaking, 
over this excitement that that Sam has about writing this 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 scientific paper on mm-hmm. on these 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 alien creatures that they discovered, even though they don't know what they look like, they don't know how to get a hold of them, they don't even know they don't know anything about them, but he's gonna write a paper on it. So I don't know how that's gonna work. But um yeah, it's just it's it's Sam, Sam gets frustrated by it, right? He's trying to he's trying to kind of make amends and you know say, Yeah, I'm proud of you, Jim, and everything else. And 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 Jim just kind of doesn't really doesn't really recognize still doesn't really recognize what Sam does, you know, for his career choice. Um, yeah. And so, uh, very interesting. Um, you know, Uhura takes the opportunity to be able to introduce Kirk and, and, and Spock for the first time. Uh, you see that handshake and, um, you start to see this, this future enterprise crew beginning to take shape. Here's where I personally have the issue. I, I'm not against Kirk being in Strange New Worlds. I just wish he wasn't in it yet. Mm-hmm. I feel like, especially this season. I think I, I swear we've seen more of Kirk in this season than we've seen of Pike. And it's like, are they trying to transition Pike out over the next season or so, and just start having Kirk take over? Because that that's been done before. We're not watching Strange New Worlds to see the Enterprise crew of Kirk and Spock and McCoy, which we haven't met yet, obviously, and Uhura and Scotty and all this stuff. We want to see Pike and the crew and the and the the ensemble that they've created this pre-Kirk Enterprise stuff. And to me, I I feel I feel like it's it's just unwarranted right now. I just I I think we've gotten too much Kirk too soon. It's one thing if they just kind of wanted to bring him on screen for a minute or two, you know, and kind of tease like, yeah, eventually Kirk's obviously going to take over because we all know that. But I just feel like it's just too much. Why couldn't Pike be the one helping Uhura? She's part of his crew. As the captain, he would be trying to help her figure out what's mm-hmm. going on. And that it's just uh, and this is nothing against Paul Wesley. I, I just I, I we've gotten too much Kirk already. And that was what was that was one of my concerns when we first started talking about Strange New Worlds in season one. I don't know if you remember or if any of our viewers or listeners remember, I made a comment, I believe, saying I just hope we don't get too much Kirk too soon. Yeah. And and, and I think I kind of feel like we are like the, the other episode tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow with him and Lon. Like. I feel like it could have been another character. They could have had another care, a new character, even that they flushed out to help her. Um, you could argue why it was Kirk and why it wasn't, but I just we're, we have too much Kirk already. Where it seems like every episode now we're getting something with him practically, and I just kind of feel like like it's it's a little bit of a at, at the detriment of of um, of Pike and and the dynamic that that has been created amongst his crew. Yeah. And then, yeah. of course, Hemmer being killed off—that was a whole thing from season one that I can't stand. Uh, but yeah, I have—I definitely have some 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 significant gripes with this episode and, and inconsistencies. And then again, the just too much Kirk too soon in the show. Yeah, those are those are very good points. Um, and maybe you're right on. Maybe they are thinking that they're trying to establish some sort of transition on on it, but it does feel like there's still a whole lot more that we can do with pike with captain pike whole lot yeah and we've got we've got what another seven plus years in the timeline before his this accident happens and he goes into the chair yeah yeah i just i just feel like uh we're getting all this kirk now it's like oh we we, everybody loves kirk so let's just give them more kirk well well yeah we like kirk but we're not watching this show for kirk we're watching it for the other characters that have been created and other characters that are being flushed out that we know Mm-hmm. And and to learn about what life was like on the Enterprise before Kirk becomes a captain. In my opinion, Kirk should not have shown up in Strange New Worlds until towards the very end of the show, whenever they were going to be done with it. Give him a, an episode or two, and then the you know transition him into being captain as the show ends. Yeah, and then it goes off, and then you would have toss, and it would be this nice transition. But I feel like they're just it's like oh we're just going to give them Kirk because we think that'll be that'll be good and that'll be lots of. Lots of uh, high ratings because everybody loves Kirk. Well, but we're not tuning in to watch Kirk on the show. We're tuning in to watch Pike and the crew. So yeah. I, I, I just I have too much of a gripe about this. I'm just I'm really frustrated. And again, it's nothing against Paul Wesley. I'm not saying anything bad about him or his his acting or his portrayal of Kirk. Uh, I just don't think it's the right choice. 
for this show. You know, you mentioned McCoy, and I wonder, I mean, we've got Kirk, we've got Spock, and so I wonder if they're thinking, I wonder if they're thinking about introducing the character of, of McCoy at some point down the line, either either season two or season three. But, you know, since they have all of these other transition characters, that might be something that they're going to do. I don't, we'll see. It, it, it could be, but we also have Dr. Mbenga, and I'd like to see them flush him out more. You yeah, know what there's I mean? a lot more that could do with him. Yeah, yeah, because he he wasn't a huge character in Toss, right? So, uh, we we already know McCoy. We have we know a lot about McCoy. I don't think we need to flush him out a ton. I mean, maybe some, but I just this was my fear going into Strange New Worlds when it started. And the first time we saw Kirk in Strange New Worlds, I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> like, they brought Kirk into season one, and I and I think I remember even saying in our on our season one recap and review that uh you know they brought they should not have brought kirk in already in the first season yeah. and they shouldn't have brought him in in the second season either they should have brought him in like let's say they were, they were going to do and maybe they don't know how many seasons are going to do but let's say they were going to do six seasons of strange new worlds bring him in in season six yeah or maybe like one episode in season five just to introduce him and say yep we know he's out there he's coming okay got it but then, but then bring him in in the last season towards the end and, and to help that and have that transition over a couple of episodes where he becomes captain of the Enterprise and then the other crew eventually come on board. But save all that. Let's let's work on the characters that were brought in early and the characters that are part of the Pike, you know, Enterprise. And let's run them through all these seasons before we start doing toss stuff, like toss characters. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that makes sense. That, that's good. When I think about these types of episodes, like um, these horror horror type episodes and the uncertainty that's with the crew. Um, it, so like we said before, this one did remind me a lot about the TNG episode um, where we had Counselor Troy kind of having these visions and hallucinations. Um, I like all the horror parts where you don't know what's going on and you've got these hallucinations, you've got these visions, you've got all this bad stuff happening. Um, but, but the resolution of it, like we said before, and it was like wrapped up really quickly, the, the re resolution of it where it's like, oh, it's these aliens and these aliens are trying to communicate with us. And, you know, now we figured it out. That's why everyone's got this. Uh, that's why these visions were happening. Yeah. I feel like, well, okay, that I, I would like it where, um, it doesn't get wrapped up in that nice tidy little bow, like mm. at the end. Right. So you're just going, we don't know why. We don't know why this is happening. And that kind of leaves it where, um, leaves it with more uncertainty, a little bit more fear at the end. Because when you wrap it up, it's kind of like, okay, we've, we've solved this scientifically. There's no reason to be afraid anymore. We've kind I don't of even, they didn't even solve this scientifically, though. They solved it based on some hallucinations. Yeah. And they yeah. just made a bunch of assumptions like, oh, we think they're these maybe interdimensional beings and we think they're communicating using atoms and we think that this and we think, but they didn't, they didn't do anything scientific about it. It's all just a hallucination. Well, we have to just assume that the hallucination of these two crew members that seem to be similar are mm -hmm. aliens and we're killing them. And now we have to blow up this significantly strategic thing that's going to help the Federation in its fight against the Gorn and be able to continue exploration moving forward. And then Pike's answer was, oh, well, we'll find some other nebula. Well, just because <laughs> you find another nebula doesn't mean you're going to find a bunch of deuterium there either. So, yeah. I mean, I, I would have rather seen them come up with a way to collect the deuterium without hurting the aliens so that they could do – they could get both because that's happened before. Yeah. That kind of thing's happened where they're able to figure something out and do it while not, you know, affecting somebody else. So, yeah, I, I had a lot of issues with this episode. Um, there were some great touching moments with Pelia and Una, obviously with Hammer, which we loved seeing Hammer again. Um, and, and some, and some, some nice moments, it's Kirk and Spock meeting, but again, why did Kirk and Spock have to meet in season two? <laughs> Let them fricking meet later. Like my goodness, why are we, why are we ramming Kirk down people's throats? We don't need more Kirk. We have a lot of Kirk already. He's already well established. Like how about we, gee, I don't know continue to explore the characters that they've created, like the new characters. You know, I mean, we've got Uhura. I love that we're learning a lot about Uhura we never knew before. 
But there's more to explore with Una, with Laon and her backstory with, with being tied to Khan, which we got a little, you know, a fairly good amount of in, in Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. But also, like, how she was captured as a kid, the Gorn, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, uh, Lieutenant Ortegas, we could definitely get a lot more of her backstory. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much, and all we're doing is, hey, more Kirk, guys. Like, <laughs> it's not more cowbell in this case, all right? We don't need more cowbell. We don't need more Kirk. All right, I'm done sounding off. I'm sorry. I'm just, no, it's I'm, all good. I'm frustrated. I was very concerned that this was going to happen in Strange New Worlds, and this is yeah. the route that they're going. And I, I, I don't like it, honestly. I really don't. No, it's all I don't good. like it's that they're throwing a lot of Kirk at us. And it's not that I don't, I don't like Kirk. Don't get me wrong. I just... I don't think it's right for this show right now. Yeah. All good. You know, I, I think it's okay to end these horror type of episodes with a little bit more mystery. Yeah. Uh, just mis yeah. just mystery. They don't have to it could just be like, we don't know what we don't know what happened. Don't you kind of feel like that's what happened when when they killed off Hammer? Like it wasn't a happy ending, number one, right? Because he died. Mm -hmm. But there was still some mystery to that. Yeah. And I thought that was much better done than the way they did this one. Yeah. Doesn't have to be tied up with a bow. Just leave it like, hey, yep, we're not, we don't know. Yeah. Well, if you guys agree or don't agree <laughs> with our, our take on this episode, please let us know in the comments below or send us a message on Facebook and, and Instagram and let us know what your thoughts are of this episode number six of season two of Strange New World entitled Lost in Translation, which makes sense given the what goes on in the episode. Um, but uh, yeah, Chris, this was... Uh, for me, this was a controversial episode just because mm. as for the things I just stated. Right. And uh, I may I may, maybe I'm going overboard on it. Maybe I'm being too tough on it. Let me know. Um, feel free, you guys, to, to to shoot me messages and let me know I'm way off my rocker on this. But I, I, I really do hold firm and think that we're just we're getting too much Kirk too soon in the show. Um, I, I didn't want him in season one. I didn't want him in season two. Like. It's not that I don't want him in the show because he's got to take over the Enterprise, but let's let's wait, push it down, push it down towards the end of the uh, of the show. Whenever you do that, whatever, whenever you say, hey, this is gonna be the last season, that's when you could bring Kirk in. The more Kirk you have, the less time we have to explore these other characters. We've got Admiral April, who was a captain of the Enterprise, which I, I believe he was captain before Captain Pike, which we know very little about, right? We know mm -hmm. he's he's an ad admirable admiral. Um. Yeah. So there's how about more Tellarites, <laughs> more Andorians like that. The bartender or whatever it was, you saw his hands were blue, right? That had to be. They didn't show his head, but that had to be an Andorian. Yeah. So there's lots of there's lots of things they could do from this time period other than just bring in Kirk. Like that's not it, it almost it's it's too easy. It's too it's just oh, gosh. All right. I got to stop. I'm going to get more angry. Stop. Yeah, it's just frustrating. But anyways. So thank you all so much for watching and, and tuning in this episode. As always, we appreciate it. Uh, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button if you're on YouTube or whatever the follow button is on your favorite podcast platform for the most current and up-to-date information. And follow us on Facebook and Instagram where you will get all the latest and greatest to include new episode announcements or episodes uh, coming soon or celebrity guest interview announcements. All that type of stuff is on our social media platform. So be sure to check us out there. And uh, we look forward to uh, bringing you episode number seven review coming very, very soon. I believe it's called uh, Those Old Scientists. This is the, this is the crossover with straight, uh, Lower Decks. So we look forward to talking about that. Uh, and that episode should be out uh, at the time of this episode airing. That episode should be out tomorrow. So mm -hmm. Sunday. Um, so we look forward to, uh, to share. Or I'm sorry. No, not Sunday. Monday. So we look forward to sharing our, our review and recap on that one with you. And hopefully there's not any Kirk in it. <laughs> oh my goodness. I sound like a Kirk hater, but it's not, I'm not meant to be. It's just because of this show and what we're, I think it should be accomplished here. Um, but anyways, thank you all so much. And uh, we appreciate it as always. And we'll catch you next time right here on the random redshirt podcast. <laughs>